All right, what's up guys? So this week I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm going into Fortran. Now there's a couple reasons why I'm going into this. One is it's a setup for the next Julia video, which will be interfacing with Fortran. The other is more because Fortran is still used a lot in the academic world. Now Julia is a great language and whether you use Julia or you use Python or whatever language, a lot of legacy code was coded in Fortran and a lot of modern code is still co coded in Fortran. And maybe you're more using Fortran to actually develop all your research projects and you're using more Julia or some other plotting language to just plot out all your results and to more do the data analysis rather than the actual data processing. So because of that and because of how technical Fortran is in some aspects, I thought I'd give it its own mini series and we can go a little bit deeper into Fortran and learn some of the ins and outs of how the language works. So if that all sounds cool to you, please give this video a like and subscribe. Now, as an extra tidbit, if you find this video or any of my other Fortran videos a bit too terse, I use this book. Does that work? Did you see that? Link will be in the description either way. Furthermore, online resources tend to not describe what standard they're going into. And I don't really see many many resources go into modern Fortran. A lot of them tend to go into 95 or the 77 standard. But modern Fortran covers some of the newest aspects that Fortran has, and it has been really helpful. The author of the book is one of the co-founders, and extra thing, I'm not sponsored by it in any way, shape, or form. It's just a resource that I like to use, and I thought I'd recommend it to you guys if you want to learn more about Fortran. Okay, I'm done babbling there. Let's go more into the code here and start up what we see here. I have a module, and a module in Fortran is just like a module in Julia. So this is the end of the module. This is the top of the module. Side of it is a repository of code. This use ISO Fortran N is a native library and that actually contains all the precision that you can use for your different data types. And then this implicit none is something that comes from the older Fortran standards. High level, it mainly just ensures that certain variables don't get predefined when you're coding up your functions or your routines. I'll go more into it into a different video. So next we have this contains and after this contains is all our function definitions and all our code and the main bulk of what the module will be. So first we have our first function and we have it called as basics and in here I'm gonna define some data types. Okay, so starting from the get go, we have some code here that I just added and these are some of our data types. So real, real 64, this is a float of 64 precision. We have an integer of int64, so that, that's its precision. A complex, that's a complex number. Once again, using float64 precision. Logical is how Fortran defines Booleans. And then a character of len12 is a string. If you don't give it a length, then it's just a char of one length. Now this real64, int64, all these stuff, this is what comes from that library above, this ISO Fortran env. And this is what's defining the precision for the variables. If you wanted smaller precision, let's say memory is really important, you can do real 32. You can also do real 128 if you really need quad precision. Now, another thing to be aware of in Fortran, whether you're using functions or subroutines, which subroutines we'll go into later, you have to define all your data types at the very top. If you need to use more data types as your function progresses or grows more complex, you have to go back to the top and define them all up there. If you define them in the middle of your code, you'll get an error. Okay, now I'm gonna go into defining some of these. All right, so we have some definitions here. Now, if you remember, A and B are floats, and here, even though I'm writing them as ints, they're going to be rewritten as floats, which we're going to see in the print statement down here. I and J are ints, C is a complex, and because it has a real and imaginary part, that's what these two bits are. Now, this is how Fortran does Booleans. You have to put a period on each end, so period, true, period. You do the same for false. And then the message is hello world. And then I'm just printing all these out. So now I'm going down to where I'm calling all this. Down here, I have this program called main. And right now, this is all in one script. But if you want to imagine it, this program main could be its own script, like a main.f90, how like this is called a mod learn at dot f90. And this is importing the module. So use mod learn. And it's only calling the basics function that I defined above. Doing that implicit none again, you can see here I have a logical flag and it's being assigned to basics. Then it's printing out that flag. Now, if we look up, 
basics is our logical and basics is also the name of our function. So when you're working with functions in Fortran, the function name is the variable that you're returning. So this function's name is basics that it's waiting for you to define what that basics variable is, which in this case, I defined it as a logical and it's going to return that variable back to wherever you're calling it. Now in program, I assign flag as a logical, so it's getting returned to that variable and it's going to print out that variable. Okay, now getting down into compiling Fortran code, if you look to the top left, I just have the mod fortran.f90 and then a make file. We're not doing the make file right now, that's for the future, but let's just go as if I was just compiling this on my own here. First, I would call g fortran c modlearn.f90, file that. You can see it created two new files. So we have the modlearn.o and modlearn.mod. The .o file is the object file, and that's what we're feeding into our next command. So g fortran modlearn.o dash o, and then I'm going to call this main. And this is creating the actual executable, and this is what's going to run our code. Then if I want to run that, I'm going to do the dot slash main and call that. And you can see it did all our prints, right? So we have, go back up here, printing out our two floats as floats and our two ints. We have our complex. We have our bools, which is basics. Then we printed our message and then it printed out our logical again, because that's what it's doing from here. So it's printing out what it returns and it's calling that here. Now, an extra thing, because this is a complex, you can access it like this. So C percent R E C percent I M. Now that I reran it, you can see it, this is the real part. This is the imaginary part. And the percent sign is how Fortran accesses its objects. So if you have a class or a type, you defined it and it has field elements. These are its two field elements. Complex is defined like that. And this is how you access the, the complex variable. Okay, next let's go into some control flow. So we have if a is less than zero, then now this is the rest of the code block. And we have our if, our else if, and our else. And you can see this is pretty similar to how you would do it in Julia as well. Main difference is there's a then, and the way that Fortran ends its any of its code blocks is it does end and keyword. So here it's an if block, so end if. Next we're gonna look at do's and it will be end do. So in this code block, I have a is negative, a is positive, a is zero based off of these conditionals and it will work exactly how we intend it to. So in here, I'm gonna be calling the console command just as, as one, a one-liner. So you can see I have the g fortran, g fortran dot main just calling it one go just so it can compile everything and just run it on one instance. A is positive. You can see, remember A was one. If I replace this with zero, A is zero. So our, our control statement works. Now for do loops, they are similar to for statements and other codes. I'm going to define the start, the stop, and if you needed to, you can define the increment. So two, negative one, whatever you're doing. And here, I'm just going to print I and it will be end do. You can see it printed out i from 1 to 10, and then the true statement is just from the program. Now similarly, we have do while, which if I had wanted to find it like this, a do while i is less than 10. OK, now you can see it did the first do loop. That was right here. Then I'm restarting i at 1, and it's going 1 to 9, because I'm doing less than 10. Okay, next we're gonna go into arrays. And like I said before, we had to go back to the top if we want to define new variables. So I'm gonna define two different types of arrays. I'm gonna have a CR, and this is gonna be five elements. And then I have this DR array. You can see now I added a new keyword called allocable. Now C array is defined with five elements and that's how the compiler is gonna run with it. What allocable is saying that currently I don't know what size my array is, but after some computation, some kind of work or whatever, I'm going to allocate this D array to some size. So this colon is kind of a placeholder saying, I don't know what size yet, but in the future, we're going to define it. Now down here first, I'm going to allocate the D array. 
and I'm going to give it the size of I. And with Fortran, it actually supports slicing. So I can just make every element one, and I'm going to print it off. Then I can also just change the element if I want to. I'll change this element to three. Okay, so we have our array one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That works out. And then one, two, three. This is our three. Now, another thing about D arrays or about arrays in Fortran, they are column major, so similar to Julia. They also index at one, also similar to Julia and MATLAB. Now with our C array, you, if you remember, we already defined it, so I can just print it out. Then I can also just change it completely. So I'm going to do this. Okay, now we can see, so this is our D array up here and our C array, because we haven't done anything when we first print it, it just gives us these undefined values. And then next, when we actually hard code what values we want in that array, because it's a, a float, it turns all these ints into floats, and that's how our C array is defined. Okay, and just so that I touched on it, if you wanted to define a larger array, so let's say we have C, R, it's a five by five now, so that's how you would define it here. We have five comma five, and you would do the same thing if you wanted allocable, you would put two colons, and you can see as, as our arrays get bigger, our our print statement becomes more messy and this just becomes tougher and tougher to read. And finally, let's go into subroutines. Now, we've been working in a function this entire time. A subroutine is essentially a function as well. I'm going to call this sub a and we're going to insert x, y, and z. Now, here is our new block of code. Now, you can see I now have another keyword called intent. Now, subroutine is different from functions in that it can return multiple variables, kind of. What's actually going on is when you're inserting the variables, you describe their intent. When you're describing intent as in, that means you don't want to change it, you don't want the user to change it, and it can't be altered in any way. When you're describing it as in out or out, that means you're inserting the variable and it may be altered in some sort of fashion. So you can see down here, I'm just printing out X and it's just gonna print out what I insert as one of the arguments. And then Y and Z, which are two of our other arguments, have intent in out. And I'm gonna increment by one or decrement by one. Now up here in our actual function, I'm first printing out I and J, so those are integers. And then I'm calling that subroutine, which this is how we actually call subroutines. We use this keyword called call. The sub a i'm inserting all those variables and then i'm going to print out ij again and you can see it it did what we expected right so we had i and j it was 10 5 and then we did alteration and became 11 4. now the last thing i want to go into is just how you would break up this code into two files if you actually were trying to do a module setup so our module should be one file and then this program main should be in its own file i'm just going to do that right now Similar to how I was doing modules with the Julia code, this is our module, this is all the code for our module, and in our main, we have our program main, and it's calling that module mod learn, calling that one function, and it's going to print out what that function does. Now compiling it, there is an extra step, so I'm just going to write everything out again. But first, we're going to compile F90, because that is the bottom level, and then I need to compile the main, then you compile everything together. So we insert our mod learn, our main dot o dash o. Now we have our executable, all that, and we have our code. And as you can see, as you get more and more modules, this, this gets tiresome to write, especially if you have tons of flags you want to add, and this is where the make file comes in. Now the make file I'm going to go into later, but that's just a preview. Okay, and that's what I have for you this week. So hopefully that all made sense on coding Fortran and I try to stick with the modern Fortran language. If you like what I've been doing, please give this video a like and subscribe. The Twitter and IG links are in the description. I'll be posting weekly announcements about the channel. If you have any requests for what to cover in the future, feel free to tweet at me at Twitter at DJ's Office Hours or email me at DJ's Office Hours at gmail.com. Hope you learned something new and I'll see you guys next week.